Well, g'day, Curd Nerds. Today we've got an interview with another YouTuber, a cheesemaking YouTuber. Well, not really cheesemaking, but cheese history, which is something dear to my heart after I read a, uh, a book, which we'll probably discuss today. I'm not sure, but we'll, we'll talk about that. But our host, uh, our host, our guest today is Julia. And Julia runs a channel called Cheese History. Let me bring her in. There she is. Hello, Julia. Welcome to the channel. Hi, Gavin. Thanks for having me. That's all right. Now, you're from New Zealand, is that right? Whereabouts? Yep. Um, I currently live in Auckland, but I grew up in quite rural New Zealand in, in the Bay of Plenty, if anyone knows where that is. It's kind of um, sort of in the dip on the North Island. Oh, okay. The big bay it... there. And, yeah, probably need a map, but... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I can put a map overlay up over the thing. That'll be fine. How's that sound? Um, now, so is that, it's not dairy country though, is it? Yeah, it is. It so is. I grew up, oh. I grew up with um, a, a dairy farm surrounding my parents' house and kiwi fruit across the road. So quite rural. Oh, okay. Yeah, I grew up on a dairy. Did you know that? Mm, yeah, I think you have said that before. <laughs> oh, there you go. So let's talk a little bit about your channel. So cheese history, what was the inspiration behind covering the history of cheese making? Mm, um, so I, I got into history as a teenager, I started reading world history, because I got into historical fiction, I suppose. Um, so I've always had an interest in history. And I almost always have a, a history book that I'm reading. So um, at some point, I came across um, Paul Kinstead's cheese and culture, which is like a, a brief history of of cheese, which is which is a great book. Um, That's the book and I, I read, read that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's the book I read. It's a great book. Yeah, absolutely. I'd recommend it to anyone who's interested in, in cheese history because it kind of covers it from the beginning all the way through to kind of uh, industrial processed cheese today. So I, I read that and was like, okay, now I'm. Has he written another book? He, he must, there must be more to say because he doesn't cover everything. Um, and I mean, I was uh, thinking about. Um, you know, that I wanted to do something with my love of history earlier this year because I, I got into video editing just a little bit, just, you know, uh, holiday videos. So I was kind of like playing around with editing. I thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun to sort of make some kind of history videos? Mm. Because I like history and I watch a lot of YouTube history um, and it, it seems like it's really kind of taking off at the moment. And there's this, but there's so much that has been covered. There's so much to cover. And um, thinking about it, I thought, oh, well, I could combine you know history and cheese because although Paul Kinsey's book's great it doesn't cover everything and um he's got a little Ted Ed video on YouTube which is like the brief history of cheese yeah um but that's like a five minute video there's, there's so much more you could talk about so I thought oh well if no one else has done a cheese history YouTube channel then um then I should probably do it because, yeah. you know, if it's not out there, you might as well do it yourself. Why not? That's right. Uh, that's one of the reasons that I created my channel because there were mm. no, well, at the time, there were no uh, cheese making uh, video tutorials per se. So, yeah, yeah, and that's a good idea. When you find a niche and you are passionate about it, it's always great to fill it. So you're doing a great job. Now, did you get a little bit of inspiration from Max Miller from Tasting History? Yeah. Just a little bit. I, I discovered his channel last year when it sort of started to take off. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting sort of stuff. He started with cheese as well. Although that wasn't the video I, I um, sort of discovered his channel from. But I was like, oh, he started yeah. with cheese and um, he does really interesting sort of stuff. So I thought, oh, I could draw some inspiration from from what he's done. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, I, I watch all his videos and yeah. he's brilliant. He is great. <laughs> he, he is He's he's a character, that's for sure, yeah. and I, I love the his presentation on screen is just it, it mm. just makes you feel good, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and you, I've been watching some of your some of the early the earliest video that you made mm. uh, is is always the hardest one to make, isn't it? So yeah. uh, it was about the first where cheese came from, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, the origins of cheese. Yeah, so the origins of cheese, very interesting. There's always, if you read any cheese making book, right, there's always this story about a goat, a herder or shepherd or something like that who puts milk in a, a, a stomach. I don't know how where they get this from, but put milk in a stomach and then he goes to eat his lunch and he's got cheese. Uh, mm. Is that myth, fact or fiction? 
I would say it's fiction, um, mainly because early humans would have been lactose intolerant. So there's no reason for him to want to be drinking milk because, and there's also evidence that cheese making predates humans becoming tolerant to lactose, which is the, you know, most people will know as the, the sugar in milk. Yeah. Um, but the side effects of being lactose intolerant are not pleasant. So why would you take something on a journey that's going to make you feel rubbish? Yeah, Particularly exactly. if you're crossing a desert or something. <laughs> yeah, you'd be going to the toilet all the time. Yeah, pretty much. Mm. It would just not be pleasant. So yeah, I don't so, think it's. I so don't how, think it's so you think. So how do you think it started then? What what is what does the historical record show us? How it starts. How it started. Ooh. Um, so yeah, there, there seems to be some evidence that human beings were collecting milk for some reason, and one possible reason is that they would be could be using it to feed to their infants because infants are not lactose intolerant because they're, because they're, yep. they're breastfed. But if a child had lost its mother, then you have to either give it a wet nurse or you have to f uh, feed it some other type of milk until it can take solids. So I guess you first need a reason for humans to be collecting milk. Um, and either it's because they figured out they could turn it into cheese or they were collecting it for some other reason um, to feed to infants or to maybe to feed to um, young animals that had lost mm. their mothers, perhaps. So some kind of infant that could uh, digest the milk. And then um, if they were then to leave that collective milk too long, and which in a, a warm climate of the um, sort of around the Mediterranean into um, sort of um, the Middle East, yeah, the kind of really warm area, North Africa, um, yeah. where it's quite warm, then the, the, the bacteria in the milk is going to curdle that milk quite quickly. It's kind of going to start to go sour. And then you've got a very, very kind of basic cheese, but it's it's kind of a cheese in some form. And, and then, of course, then they could potentially, once they um, have consumed a lot of that cheese, maybe become more lactose tolerant. Then they could put the, the, the milk in the, in, the, in the animal's stomach yeah. and just kind of rent it. Um, yeah. But they could also discover that other ways as well by um, if they end up um, either killing or um, somehow cutting up a young baby animal when it's when it's already dead and discovering that it's the milk it's consumed has curdled in its stomach, then they might go, mm, there might be something to this particular stomach. Yeah. It has to be the fourth one, I believe. Yes. Just yes. the old stomach. <laughs> yeah, the rennet bag. So mm. um, <laughs> I don't know the technical name for the fourth stomach either, but... Uh, uh, yeah, the, the, in cheese making circles, I think it's called the rennet bag, but interesting. But yeah, no, Good that's cool because, you know, they, they slaughtered animals for food all the time. So they would have inspected the contents of what's in the gut, even though it smells a bit. But mm. um, uh, being living on a farm, I would know these things very smelly um, when yeah. you slaughter an animal. But uh, yeah, we, you know, I remember living on a dairy and we never used any of the entrails. They were for the dogs. So mm. yeah. But uh, yeah, you're right. So, you know, they'd have a look and they go, what's all this curdle white stuff? Um, you know, what would they eat? So which yeah. cult so so moving on from there, which culture was predominantly started using cheese in some form uh in in a daily routine? Um, so there's a lot of very evidence that like the Sumerians we were yeah, I'm using cheese in a whole number of different ways um you there's all kind of the oldest cheese found is um for the egyptians in one of their tombs they found some cheese offered as kind of an offering to the departed person whose tomb it was yeah i think the, the sumerians are the ones where there's kind of evidence that it was all through their culture because they were using it as uh, temple offerings but they were also um consuming it sort of on a reasonably daily basis so they're probably some of the earliest and from there it kind of spreads throughout into um, Turkey via the Hittites, often to, to Greece, Italy, all the way around Europe, um, particularly due to the, when you get to the Roman Empire, it really starts to, I guess, it really spreads a lot more and the other cultures who'd already figured out cheese making, it, it helps develop their cheese making a bit more, I guess. Yeah, for sure. So what, what sort of, what type of cheese would the Sumerians have been using? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to qu quantify um, the specific types of cheeses because the, they just, they have their own words for cheeses and they don't nicely map on to ours. We, they don't have any what kind have of today. descriptions of yeah. how they made it. It's kind of like there's big cheese, there's little cheese, there's fresh cheese, there's 
aged soldier cheese or something like that. And it's like, well, okay, um, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, so I it's... suppose from, from uh, if you look at the early or the easiest cheeses to make, it would have just been curdled milk and then drained mm. in, let's say, a basket, right? Yeah. Um, so they probably would have, and, and that's easy to make on a daily basis. So it probably would have been some sort of lactic set cheese mm. and then eventually some clever bunny, like you said, would have figured out that the rennet comes from the fourth stomach of a ruminant and, and gone on from there. Um, yeah. Is it also true, uh, here's a trick, I don't know if it's a trick question, but is it also true that the Romans stole cheese making from the Greeks? Ooh, it's a good question. Um, not sure if I've come across that one. Um, well, I suppose they invaded, they invaded them and the Greek, Greeks had cheese first before, I suppose, the um, uh, the Romans were just a fledgling little tribe when the Greeks, the Greek Empire was, um, uh, you know, in full swing. So was it the... Yeah, I, think uh, had, I think they had something close to ricotta in that the, when they were just sort of more little tribes because then they had, I think they had come across that they had like special pots for stopping them boiling over, which yeah. is quite impressive. But yeah, because the Roman Empire just kind of like absorbed stuff the best from everyone around them and they would have been they imported a lot from not just greece but um elsewhere as well so yeah they probably did uh, they definitely overtook the best cheese making areas <laughs> yeah so they were a bit like the borg of uh, of, of star trek they assimilate yeah. all the other cultures and take all their food and all that sort of stuff pretty much yeah <laughs> excellent so it was the romans that actually started developing different cheese recipes and i think if I remember rightly, it was a daily staple for legions or legionnaires um, mm. in the army. So do you, do you know a little bit about that? Yeah, I think uh, there's. it was listed as part of their like daily rations. They had a certain amount of meat and wine, I think. And then there was, a, I can't remember the exact quantity, but they um, were supposed to have a certain amount of cheese each day, which means you have to produce a lot of cheese because it wasn't like, oh, they're allowed, you know, f um, 50 grams of cheese a day. It's not that small of a quantity. It's quite yeah, yeah. quite big. But they seem to have to sort of produce it on quite a big scale in order to meet that demand, particularly when you think that they wouldn't have, had, they wouldn't have been milking their um, animals all year round. So you have a, a much shorter, like half the year, to make enough cheese to feed a whole legion mm. um, or more than a legion depending on who was stationed where um, you'd have yeah you'd have to produce quite a lot of cheese in this particular place in order to meet that particular demand they might also yeah. i suppose have brought some in from elsewhere but um, you'd still have to make quite a lot if you were doing yeah, that's local. right because, and you know a legion if i remember right the legion had about five thousand soldiers mm. uh and then they had their baggage train and they then they had the auxiliaries as well from the nations that they were they were in yep. And I don't know if they were native cheese uh, cheese eaters, the auxiliaries, but certainly the Romans were. So that means they must have had some sort of um, cheese making facilities either very nearby or their, uh, the logistics back to the Italian peninsula where they probably made all this cheese would have been quite good. Mm, yeah, they probably made it locally as well because there's like cheese making throughout the, the Roman Empire, different types, different places. And I think um, some of the finds have been finds in England where they found the molds that they they used. So they would have been making it locally for um, for the legion stationed there because to transport that amount of cheese, while possible, it would still be a mammoth undertaking mm. just because of the quantities involved for all the different legions. So you'd probably try and make as much locally as you could, which would then impact the the cheese making of the locals as well. Yeah, exactly. And then they'd learn from the Romans. Mm, pick up it's some of the like skills. That, yeah, it's a bit like the old Monty Python adage, what have the Romans ever done for us? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they don't say cheese making. in Well, they do in the movie, but, you know, blessed are the cheese makers. But Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if they had to transport all this cheese around to all the, to the legions, which were stationed everywhere, uh, some of the cheese must have had to be like a hard cheese, like obviously mm. Romano, which named after the Romans. So a, a hard style cheese that could be easily transported. Um, yep. So it's, it's, it's amazing that just from those roots and then the, I suppose the, uh, the collapse of the Roman empire, uh, was cheese making still prevalent, uh, prevalent in the, in Europe? 
Yeah, so after the collapse of the Roman Empire, um, you kind of have uh, the, the Dark Ages, I suppose, um, yeah. where um, the whole, most of Europe, more or less all of Europe, is Christian at that point, and you find a lot of cheese making in the monasteries. Oh, which yes, is sort of like yes. the stereotype of, of monasteries. Course. Right here and cheese. Yeah. So a lot of it um, gets sort of centralised there and on estates where you'd have people. Uh, where you have the, the herds of animals, so therefore you have the facilities to sort of make cheese. And that's, I think, when um, more regional variations that we're more familiar with sort of start to appear as well, uh, associated with, with monasteries or monks, and then spread out, out um, beyond that. But yeah, it's quite kind of fascinating how the, um, the after the Roman Empire, it's almost up to the church to <laughs> preserve cheese making in yeah, to some degree. Um, it's amazing. So the monks themselves would have been the primary cheese makers and cheese, well, cow, uh, dairy herders, I suppose, for want of a better word. Um, but yeah, in the big, in the biggest states, it wouldn't have been men that made the cheese, would it? No, I think it, at some point it becomes um, women's work, and you have it's the the dairy is where. Um, as a place only for women, which is really quite fascinating. Whereas you have the, the classic uh, image of a, a milkmaid milking the cows, and then of course the milk would be taken off to the dairy, um, and it would be processed by by women as well. And you'd have mm. the the really knowledgeable um, sort of head dairy head cheese maker passing on those skills to other women uh, by making cheese, which I think is is, is really cool because uh, it kind of goes from the monks to to sort of women's work particularly i think yeah. in, in england and, and it would have been women cheese. making cheese for what at least the next thousand years until we start to get to uh industrial scale cheese making mm. which really i don't think happened uh, first in europe i think it happened in america um yeah. where they started factories uh and then i suppose men being men would have taken over some of those roles, but uh, but in Europe, I'm pretty sure a lot, a lot of uh, women are still primarily are the artisan cheesemakers, mm. which is fantastic. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we haven't skipped a period of history, have we? That we, that we should know about. Uh, I don't think well, it's probably, but yeah. So if anybody wants to know any more about the history of cheese, I think mean, how often are you producing a video? Because they take a long time to research, don't they? Yeah, I'm, I'm at the moment, I'm kind of trying to put one out every month. Um, that's that's the plan at the moment, and I'm keeping up with it roughly. Yeah. And YouTube's <laughs> not your full-time job, though, is it? No, no, I have a, I have another job as well. So, <laughs> otherwise, I would produce videos more regularly. But yeah, yeah, I, I'm I'm lucky. I'm well, I'm not semi-retired. I still work full time, but I'm uh, self-employed. Uh, so mm. you know, our online retail business is allows us to well allows me to make cheese and do the cheese videos, and so I'm like a half-time YouTuber, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I'll get there. I'll get there eventually. I don't know if I'll ever go full time, but you know, a video a week is is full time as far as I'm concerned. But yeah. but no, I tell you what. So you you write have to fully write a script before you do the show right do each yeah. episode so yeah so no wonder it takes a month it's it's i watch your videos and they're intense you know I, i'm uh, i'm kind of on the edge of my seat wondering where the heck is going because a lot of the history you go into so much detail and what i like about the videos is that you put the sources down the bottom in the description of the video um so how many history cheese history books do you have? Um, I think I have about six specific books that are kind of covered cheese or cheese history in some way because there's not actually that many of them, which is quite sad. Um, there really should be more, and I'm sure I'll find more. But most cheese books seem to be either making cheese or descriptions of cheese, so not too much on actual cheese history. Um, but yeah, I think it's quite important to put the the sources that I'm using there so other people can can check them out um yeah definitely. And I guess it's kind of a habit I picked up <laughs> no no it's good it's from university days maybe yeah yeah well I I work at a university so, oh, so I have put go. my sources everywhere so. oh fantastic uh excellent so academia um yep. so that leads me on to my next question is uh do you make your own cheese Julia yeah I do I do. Oh, also, um, it's kind of like... but not only a cheese historian, but you make your own cheese. How good's that? 
Mm, that's kind of how I got started with my cheese obsession, I suppose, was, was cheese making. So. so how did that start? Step me through that. <laughs> well, um, so I started, I, I started making bread as a sort of side thing because I, I like to make things, seemingly. And, you know, when you make dough, you can make pizza. So we started making um, pizza and thought it would be really nice with um, mozzarella, fresh mozzarella on the top of pizza because that just makes a pizza so much nicer. But here in New Zealand, at least, fresh mozzarella is not all that cheap. Mm. So it's kind of almost a, not quite an investment, but it's about you know, eight, nine, ten dollars for a, quite a small amount. So um, I'd had a, a colleague at work who'd, who'd mentioned that she'd made halloumi at some point, and that it wasn't that difficult. So yep. when we were, you know, discussing the price of of mozzarella, I was thinking, I wonder if it's possible to make make mozzarella, and how how difficult that would be, because apparently it's possible. Mm. Um, so uh, you know, like all people of my generation, I uh, I googled it. <laughs> And one of the things I came across was was your cheese making blog. Oh, um, oh that, little that green talking, cheese! It's still going. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was it was this was about 2015, so it was quite a number of years ago. Um, yeah. And you you just sort of like come back from a break at, in this particular thing, and you were like, oh, I've got back into you know made some mozzarella. I was like, mm, okay. So how does one how does one do this? Find the video, um, watch that. Okay. Find cheese making equipment, and I, I basically just kind of got started with with like easy. 30 minute mozzarella <laughs> and kind of it all sort of snowballed from there because I, I don't seem to do anything I'm interested in by halves. So if yeah. I get interested in something, it's like, and this is my sole focus of all my spare time. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, it's a bit like me and it's never gone away. Yeah. I've managed yeah. to maintain it through everything else. Yeah, but yeah exactly. Uh, so, so 30 minute mozzarella or quick mozzarella, was it easy though? Um, it worked. The Did first it work? Time. So, I mean, first I, time? Yeah, I, it worked. That is amazing Sorry. because there are so many people. If you look at any cheese making Facebook group, everybody says that mozzarella is not hard. It, well, it is. Sorry, it is hard to make. Mm. Uh, mind you, the first time I made it, I got it as well. So, yeah, uh, I've, I've been, managed to screw it recipe. up since then. But yeah, must have been the recipe I used. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So, what other sorts of cheeses have you made, Julia? Oh, I make quite a lot of different types. I, I make a lot of um, camembert and and blue cheese, uh, as well as um, Jalsberg seems to be quite one I make quite regularly because it hasn't failed yet. Mm. Um, I'm attempting to um, get good at making cheddar and Parmesan because I like those hard aged cheeses quite a lot. But um, so far, they haven't been as successful as I would like. So then my work's in progress. Mm. Um, and what else? I've made a whole lot of others. I make feta quite regularly. I've made halloumi, most of the sort of fresh ones, cream cheese. Um, yeah, mozzarella quite regularly. Although and yeah. now I tend to use the the um, cultured mozzarella. Oh, yeah, yeah. I find Just that it's... it lasts longer. It doesn't go yeah. uh, doesn't go flat the next day in the fridge <laughs> when you make yeah. quick mozzarella. Yeah, but it's and it's and it's easy to share with people because it's a little bit firmer. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it is really nice as well. Yeah, it's delicious. Well, that's fantastic. But what's your favourite one to make? Um, I like making Jalsberg the most, probably because at the moment I haven't managed to screw it up, no matter what I've done to it. Um, and it's, it's also really forgiving, it, isn't it? It is, yeah. Um, even though it always turns out an odd shape, but that's right. <laughs> that's what it's supposed to do, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it just also doesn't take too long. Um, some like Parmesan, you got lots of stirring involved. Um, yeah. Jalsberg, not quite so much. So it's no, easy, it's a, forgiving, and it's a good cheese. And it, it, tastes, it mm. tastes amazing too, doesn't it? Yeah, it seems to be the most popular one when I share it with anyone. They're like, "That is my favorite." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's excellent, mate. Excellent. So, do you make it in your own kitchen? Is it where you make all your cheese? Yep. Yep. Is there a, a supplies in New Zealand? Are they easy to come by for cheese making supplies? Um, there's not that many. So there's um, Mad Millie's, which you, know, you stock their stuff as well. So yeah. that's probably like the main su supplier. It's where I got most of my equipment from. But I mean, all their cultures are prepackaged. So yeah. to get uh, individual strains, um, there's a, a company in the South Island of New Zealand in Christchurch called um, the Urban Cheese Company, and they do all right. little. Yeah. little uh, quantities of cheese cultures so i use them for cultures and um uh, other bits and pieces 
um, and I get some stuff from Mad Millie still. So it's kind of, uh, those are the main two that I found, but because mm. we're quite a small country with quite a small population, there's not that many cheesemakers, I don't think, relative to the population. So it's hard to support multiple yeah. which, suppliers. Which would be with... funny seeing that um, you've got one of the biggest dairy in industries uh, per, set, per percentage of GDP uh, in the world, I think. Uh, is it, Fonterra is one of the biggest companies over yep. there, isn't it? Yeah, they have they have the market share of milk, but oh. but we produce milk mainly for milk powder for export. Um, yeah. So we don't even we don't have a, a great big cheese artisan cheese or even you know cheese making industry that does a whole variety of stuff. You know, we do the standard blocks of Colby, Edam, yeah, um, and types of cheddar. Basically, there are now a lot more artisan cheese producers than. Than there used to be they're kind of springing up which is kind of great to see but mm. like making a whole variety of cheeses is not really part of the cheese history of new zealand we've got yeah. a boring cheese history <laughs> <laughs> well, i suppose a little bit like australia because you know we don't we're a young country just like new zealand uh in, in you know in geological time of course uh mm. but um you know, we've got artisan cheese making springing up as well but uh and hopefully they're surviving during the pandemic so getting yeah. their produce out there because, you know, I, I'm not sure about how the pandemic's going there in, in New Zealand. I think you've got a bit of a, a handle on it, a bit, bit of more control than we have at the moment. Yeah, at the moment, yeah. Fingers crossed it stays that way. Yeah, um, so yeah. are all restaurants and stuff open over there now? Yeah, at the moment we're pretty much sort of life as normal except that it's really hard to get in to the country. Yeah, of course. It's not a good idea to go out because it's hard to get in. Um, yeah, you can go out but don't come back again. <laughs> You might not be able to come back in yeah, <laughs> for yeah. a while. <laughs> yeah, for, for a long, long time, I think. Um, yeah, so, but yeah, so, so yeah, it's... artisan cheesemakers were struggling here in Australia for a while uh, mm. due to the fact that, you know, all the restaurants um, shut down. So a lot of artisan cheesemakers have contracts with restaurants, of course, yep. uh, and that's how they sell a lot of their cheese. Um, but there's a lot of companies coming online, like um, uh, Cheese Therapy is one I can think of here in Australia, who sell um, cheese direct to the public from the cheesemaker. So they take the mm. cheese from the cheesemaker, become the cheesemonger, I suppose, uh, and then on would package that in packs and stuff like that. And I think that's been doing a lot of the artisan cheesemakers a service uh, here in Australia and, and doing doing it well. So, But, yeah, uh, um, I'd hate to see cheesemakers go broke during the pandemic because yeah. everybody loves cheese. Exactly. Except for the lactose intolerant. But then I can make lactose free cheese, which I've got yep. recipes for those too. Yep. There's, there's always a way to eat cheese. Yeah, exactly. Whether, whether you've got lactose in you or not. Um, so, other than the cheeses that you personally make, do you eat other cheeses, store bought ones, and stuff like that? Um, yeah. Yeah. You, um, you can't there's... keep up with demand, right? No, no. Um... <laughs> Particularly as uh, my husband is Dutch, so he goes through quite a lot of cheese. Ah, right. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, you have to get some store-bought cheese. Otherwise, I'd have to make cheese multiple times a week just to sort of keep the supply, uh, to keep up with demand. Um, but, yeah, um, but also because there's quite a few artisan cheese makers that sell in supermarkets here as well. So there's usually a reasonable range which has like increased a lot over the last few years, a mm. reasonable range of um, good quality artisan cheeses. That if you want to like, make a nice cheese board and you don't quite have all the stuff in your own cheese cave. Yeah, <laughs> so it's hard to do. Yes. All at the same time. You yeah, know, exactly. By some miracle, all you manage to get four cheeses at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you put a little bit in the back of the cheese fridge like I do and forget about it for five years and yes. you've always got cheese in the cheese fridge. <laughs> uh, I should do that. Start just squirreling it away in the back of the cheese. Oh, <laughs> that's what I do. I always take a little quarter of the wheel that we, you know, we'll share and all the rest and eat some of it. But I always squirrel a little quarter of each batch, put mm. it in the cheese. It always makes a good video too, by the way. So <laughs> everybody loves a five-year-old cheese, apparently. Mm. Ah, that's so good. Well, they're, they're so, hard to come by. <laughs> well, indeed, very. Because imagine if. Um, Industrial cheeses go broke if they had to keep cheese for five years in a factory stored away somewhere, wouldn't they? Or it would be ridiculously expensive. Oh, crazy, crazy expensive. So, yeah, because they'd throw on the price of, um, you know, of maintaining it, which 
for the home cheese maker, it doesn't matter. You just forget about it in the back of the fridge. If you turn it, yep. you turn it. If you don't, you don't, you know. Yep. It happens. So what's your favourite drink to go with a cheese platter, Julia? Oh, I'm I'm not a big drinker. Um, oh, all right, soft so, drink. <laughs> so, well, so, um, so about the only alcohol I drink is um, is cider. Oh, nice. Um, and there's this uh, company in New Zealand that does a really nice apple crumble cider. It's called oh. the Zephyr Cider, which is, and you know, they actually managed to capture apple crumble in the cider. Um, they have a really nice range of ciders. So if I was going to drink something with a cheese platter, it would probably be cider. <laughs> Nice. Well, actually, cider goes very well with a lot of cheeses. Mm. So a lot of people don't think about that. They always think of pairing cheese with wine, but they forget about the beers, the ciders, the perries. Um, mm. Even bland goes well with cheese, seeing it's made from cheese. So, yeah, <laughs> I've discovered that recently. But, mm. yeah, it, 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 it doesn't have to, you don't have to drink something to complement your cheese platter, if that makes sense. Yeah. But, yeah. It is nice. Okay. <laughs> All righty. So um, let me think. What other questions have we got? Oh, some of your – one thing I haven't asked you is every beginner cheesemaker doesn't always oh, – hang on. How do I describe this? Every beginner makes mistakes. Well <laughs> – Right, and that's to say, I show all my mistakes when I make them, and because I hope people learn from them, because I learn from them, that's for sure. I don't do it again. Um, what were some of your biggest mistakes, or your biggest one you can remember when you're making oh. first started making cheese? Well, I guess one of my one of my mistakes was probably something I did more recently, less sort of a um, beginner mistake. Um, so because I use cultures from that come in like a little packet. There's no sort of dosage instructions, you know, you use this amount of tea work, teaspoons, um, yeah. because it all comes in units um, and I don't have a scale small enough to weigh it. Um, so I had to kind of guesstimate how much mm. culture to use. And initially I underestimated quite a bit. So I had a whole series of cheeses that just did not work. I had um, camembert that um, would be really, really wet and wouldn't dry properly. The mold wouldn't grow properly, and then it would taste really bitter and horrible. I had, yeah. um, I think, Colby and Gouda that did the same sort of thing, and I'm like, what? It, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I'm, as far as I'm aware, I'm getting this right. And um, eventually, I think my husband was like, maybe you should try like increasing the culture because can you put too much culture in cheese? Um, you know, or at least we, it's something you could try. You probably can. Um, yeah. But, um, but like, if you doubled it, would that be too much? And if it fails, oh well, it's no different from yep. from normal. Yep. <laughs> um, so I, I did a bit of searching online to try and find someone who's made cheese with these specific cultures. And based on um, what I found, I was like, oh, I, I am actually uh, under you under <laughs> under under uh, dosing. Under dosing, basically. Yeah. So I've uh, increased the dose. Um, Not, still and, it, and it worked all right. It yeah, I've gone from failing every batch of camembert to actually successfully making every batch of camembert. Oh, fantastic. Um, whereas, yeah, I was pulling my hair out of a camembert for ages because I was like, I could make this perfectly for, for like years and now every batch is failing for one reason or another. And because I'm like, oh, well, is it because I've changed recipe and it's slightly different or is it because I'm not stirring it long enough? Am I cutting it too? You know, there's so many variables you could play with mm. to figure out what's oh, going it wrong. Is. Um, it is. But, you have to go, oh, I almost have to go through so many failures to figure out what it is. Yeah. Well, look, it, it, and it takes that sometimes. You know, mm. I've made cheeses that uh, I've either fluked the first time and not written down what I actually did. And that's the biggest yeah. That's the biggest thing I find is that I have a pen and a pad and I write down every single thing I've did, the dosage, what culture I'm using. Um, and I've got about 10 of these little books now that have mm. all the recipes and that's, you know, I, I come up and that's why I can write a recipe book because I've got all my recipes that are tried and tested and I know which one worked and which one didn't. So, uh, yep. but yeah, yeah, dosage control is one of those things that people don't think about really, especially when it comes into failure. It's so hard to diagnose. I get, I get about 10 emails a day, right, of people saying, what did I do wrong? Here's something. Mm. And it's really hard unless I'm actually there looking at their recipe with them and making the cheese with them, it's so hard. So some sometimes some of my best guesses help, I think. Mm. So, yeah, it's difficult to do, isn't it? Yeah. 
but yeah, got there in the end. Seems to you got work. there in the end. Um, what about your cheddars and part? You have them. You gone into cheddars yet? Yes, you were saying. Um, yeah, I have uh, a couple of cheddars. So um, stir curd or normal cheddaring? Oh, I've done I've done one stir curd, but most of them are cheddaring. Um, and we'll, we'll see in a few months whether uh, yeah. the latest one worked, which yeah. is the, the first one I've done with a slightly increased amount of culture. So I've got one that's a possible. Mm. Yeah. The, the cheddars, because um, because I was measuring the pH, they turned out all right. They just turn out more like um, Colby <laughs> rather than oh, right. cheddar. Okay, milder. Um, yeah. And my Parmesans are a bit weird. <laughs> so the, um, the last one I cut open, they always seem to develop eyes for some reason. Oh, and, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So I always, it always swells up. I'm not quite sure why. Um, I'll figure it out. It could be the culture thing. Um, and um, it's also never quite get crumbly, but it's probably the culture thing. So yeah, I, it could the be. The next because, cheese on my list is Parmesan. Yeah, because um, I'm just trying to think. I had the first time I made a Parmesan it was a dismal failure. The Parmesan blew up like a balloon. Mm. And inside, I've got photos somewhere that. I've got the rind, which is that thick, and the rest is air. It's one big <laughs> bubble on the inside. But I still yeah. grated the cheese. It was rock hard. I still grated it. And, uh, you know, the family loved it on pasta and stuff like that. So, you know, it doesn't matter what you do with cheese. You can always eat it as yeah. far as, you know, as long as it's not contaminated or anything like that, you know. Or just unpleasant. <laughs> yeah, or taste bitter. They're, they're, the yeah. they're the ones that you know you've done something wrong, either – not enough culture or too little or not enough mm. salt or what have you. Yep. Crazy. Yep. All righty. So um, what words of encouragement would you give, Julia, to a newbie cheesemaker who has never made a cheese, but they want to, they're eager and they want to go? What would you give them? Um, pick something simple and just go for it. You know, get your basic equipment and uh, get some decent milk and just uh, make something like feta mozzarella something easy even um, even halloumi i suppose is yeah hard to screw up so like pick something that's probably quite a young fresh cheese and just sort of go for it um, particularly if you get a little cheese making kit like you can here <laughs> that gives you everything you need to do uh need mm. to um to actually do it so yeah i'd say that's that that's the best place to start is um give it a go and see see how you like it mm. Simple. Yeah, I'd, I'd highly recommend starting with something easy because there's nothing worse than trying something, failing, and then never trying again mm. um, because you'll never know whether you're any good at it if you don't give it another go. But, yeah, yeah. like like I said, some of those, a lot of the kits, you know, like we sell lots of kits in our business, um, and they're, um, you know, they're all tested, so they, mm. they work. So you follow the instructions to the letter with the stuff yep. given to you in the kit and not try and substitute it with something else. Then usually you, you don't have too many problems, so it's always yep. it's always good to give it a go. But, and there's uh, always your tutorials to watch as well. Oh, thank great, you very much. Yes, of course. Of I forgot those. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I make them all the time. But yes, if you get stuck, go and watch one of Gab's video tutorials. That's me. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll go from there. But uh, yeah, so how? Here's my last question. Well, I think it might be my last. We'll see how we go. So, making a YouTube channel is not easy. So uh, have you got any tips for anybody who wants to start a new YouTube channel? Um, I guess one tip would be that to come up with an idea or something that you think will interest you for for a quite a long period of time or something that um, at least has the scope to make you know, more than a couple of videos. So I guess first you need your idea and sort of to define kind of a rough idea of what you want to do because you start somewhere and it'll probably morph into something else mm. because i think I, we had i had a you know a rough idea of like oh here are like you know i think it was about 40 or 50 possible episodes i could make and um i think if i went back to i've probably done one of those um yeah. because it's kind of taken on a life of its own so i guess one thing would be like figure out what you want to do on your channel and the other would be to um find other channels that you like to watch and that you find interesting and sort of figure out what, what are the some of the things that they do that you could incorporate into your channel because you don't have to reinvent the wheel you can mm. look at what other people do and kind of go oh i like that particular part of what they do i could do that or you know I, I like the way that they you know put their information in like that or how they display this on the screen at this point or blah blah blah, blah. you know it's like pick the things that you like to like 
that you like to watch that are sort of a similar genre to the idea that you've got and sort of, I don't know, pick a few ideas that you could incorporate in and then sort of just do uh, make little changes kind of as you go say oh well I'll, I'll do this this time and then then the next one i might incorporate uh, as something a little bit different yeah um, so like you don't have to be perfect on your first video because it's often the hardest so you know, go easy on yourself yeah for sure <laughs> the first video is not always the best i look back at the very first one i made and it was a 40 second video of me panning around the kitchen when I was making cheese, no, no video, no audio, nothing. I didn't say a word and mm. it's still there. People watch it. And I think they go, this is the first video we ever made. Um, but yeah. And the second one wasn't much better because at the time I think YouTube, this is back in old school YouTube, mm. that only gave you 10 minutes for a video. That was it. So try to fit in, uh, you know, a five hour cheese making session in 10 minutes. It's difficult. So I actually split the, I think the first cheese I made was, could have been kefili or parmesan. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, mm. I had to split it into three separate videos, part one, two, and three. Uh, and I don't think I, I talked. The microphone was shocking. The lighting was shocking. The oh, the camera I had was, I think, in 720p back in the day, and it was shocking too. Mm. But, hey, you made it. You put it up there, and you go for it from there. You, you always get better. Yeah. One of the things, one of the things I always I struggled with at the start was editing. So, <laughs> how's oh. your editing skills? They're getting better. I mean, I because I started um, just you know ed editing holiday footage together. So we just go yeah. somewhere, take a little bit of footage, you know, edit it together, and then send it off to friends and family. To go oh, look what we did. Um, mm. That I kind of learn, I guess, the basics of video editing that way. So I, I guess with my editing as well, I've tried to like learn maybe a little new skill each video I put out or develop it in some kind of way. And I just started off keeping the editing quite simple. Otherwise, uh, it was going to take me so long to edit edit a video if I wanted to learn how to do everything that everybody else does just for the first yeah. video. But but yeah, I think I, my channel's only been going a few months and I, always, I already look back at the first one and go, mm, I could have done that a bit better. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, it, but, if I had a reg... So that's why I remake some of my videos mm. because not only did I think the recipe was not a, the best as it cost, it possibly could be but the video itself uh, the instructions weren't clear so i try mm. and you know and, and a lot of people watch them and re-watch them again they don't care they, it's a yeah. cheese video they'll watch it you know which yeah. is great because there's such a support so much support in the curd nerd community which is why i hope a lot of the viewers that are watching today go and check out your channel so tell us where they can find you on the socials and on youtube and all that sort of stuff um, so um, my channel is called Cheese History on YouTube, and um, I'm also on Instagram. I think I'm cheese.history on Instagram. There's links on my YouTube page. Um, yeah. I mean, I've set up a Patreon account, and I don't have any Patreons yet, but it's it's there in case anyone wants to come and support what I do. Um, we'll just see what happens with that. But, yeah, so I'm <laughs> mainly on uh, YouTube and, and Instagram at the moment. So I post pictures of the cheese I make on Instagram as well as um, I'll post stuff about the history of cheese as well as i yeah. find stuff to post so yeah of course now i'll pop the um the links to your channel and your insta page down in the description of this video for anybody who's watching so they can go and check out julia's very good cheese history videos i love them i can't get enough of them julia they're great keep them coming <laughs> yeah will do <laughs> fantastic well it's been lovely talking to you um I really enjoyed catching up with you. So yep. hopefully um, some people will pop over to your channel and have a look at your great work. Yep, it's been great talking to you, Evan. Thank you. No problems at all. Thanks, Julia. See you later, mate. See ya. Bye-bye. Oh, Bye. -bye. Bye.